so I just like to start with something that's not on dates and times at all. I started doing this just under two years ago uh, at a Caribbean conference, and I was going to present without any slides, and the conference organizer said, oh, okay, we'll put a giant picture of you in the background. And I thought, that's a terrible idea. Uh, people have got to put up with seeing me in person you know, once, let alone twice with a, a giant version of my face. No, I, I said, just put be kind up there. And it was just a, a quick decision, and I hadn't really thought about it. But now it's a central part of when I do presentations, I like to remind the audience and myself just to be kind at the very start and end. Uh, if I can help the tech industry to be very slightly kinder, then actually that would mean more to me and I think more to the world than if I can teach you about dates and times and C-sharp and versions and all kinds of things. Uh, I think the world needs a lot more kindness. I'm sure you're all very kind people anyway. I'd like to think that I'm naturally reasonably kind, uh, but just being reminded explicitly helps us to just remember and next time we're in a situation where we can go one of two ways, maybe we'll go the kind way. So today we are talking about dates and times and the background to uh, this talk is really that we've all got problems when it comes to dates and times, okay? Most of us will have code that uses dates and times and I suspect I haven't seen your code. Maybe it's brilliant, maybe it's all perfect, but I suspect many of us have bugs in that code. And maybe those bugs only show up for one or two hours per year. And that makes it really hard to test or really hard to be confident in it. And so there's a lot of fear in this topic. And my main message today is that working with dates and times is manageable. You can get it right and you can be confident about getting it right as well. A large part of that is using the right tools for the job. And my sort of secondary message for the day is to use the right tools. And for .NET, I would like to think that the right tool is Nodatime, which is a date and time library that uh, I've authored since about 2008. And the background to the background is that I originally gave a talk uh, for Stack Overflow Dev Days a long time ago, back in 2008. Um, that was on the mess that humanity has made of our most fundamental data types. So strings and numbers and dates and times. And during that talk, I gave the same kind of message of we should use the right tool for the job. And I was able to say at the time, this was before Java 8 and things, for Java, use Joda time. For .NET, use, there isn't anything. Um, and I felt terrible having to say that because there are problems with date time and date time offset, which I'll come on to. Uh, I, I felt bad for not being able to say, here's the right tool for the job. So foolishly, I decided that I needed to try to fix this situation as best I could. Um, I'm not going to claim that Node Time is the best API in the world, that it's suitable for absolutely everyone, that there are no bugs in it. You know, I'm, I'm personally proud it's the, the code base that I have probably put put the most love into, let's say. Um, and I'm hoping that it's uh, reasonably bug-free, um, but I'm not going to claim perfection or anything. I will just say it's better than uh, using date time and date time offset. And a lot of this talk will go into the reasons I have for that. So we're gonna start, we're gonna do two sort of halves of this talk. And the first is going to be focusing on the key concepts. Um, that you ought to think about when you're writing date and time code. And you can uh, you can write date and time code without using node time. I'm very, very aware that you may have your own date and time library or the you have to use the .NET one, you can't use third party, you can't use open source, whatever it is, but you can still apply these concepts. You may need to reframe them slightly, but if you think about dates and times this way, I believe you will be reasonably successful in your code. So we'll talk through all of those, um, or at least the, the most important ones. There are actually so many concepts and so many types, uh, certainly in no time, that I couldn't possibly cover them all now. And that's absolutely fine. 
you'll you'll see the most important ones and the rest once you understand those sort of skeleton ones the rest of the the bits and pieces fit in quite easily we'll then stop for a little break uh, or rather for for some questions um so if you put those onto telegram max will uh relay those when we get about halfway through and then for the second half of the talk i will focus on a few good ideas and bad ideas you know here's what not to do here's what you can do here's what you might want to do but it's kind of maybe maybe not so let's dive straight in um, with the first concept which is an instant in time and that sounds really simple um, but my experience is that lots of people don't necessarily think about it in the most helpful way so i like to think that an instant is something that everyone across the world across the universe can agree on at the same time so however we're representing it and the concept is separate from the representation however we're agreeing on it if i were to snap my fingers on a telephone call and um if we had a telephone with infinitesimal lag so no lag at all and we'll ignore relativity and all those complicated things but if i snap my fingers and you're at the other end of the telephone line we can agree on what instant in time i snapped my fingers it doesn't matter if you're in a different time zone it doesn't matter if you're using uh some different calendar system we can agree on an instant in time and that's really important for things like timestamps for example in a database or in a logging system or whatever it represents an instant in time which is the same everywhere now thinking about the representation of that uh, typically instants are represented as some sort of epoch some kind of starting point um, so the .NET epoch is uh, date time dot min value which is the uh, the first of january year one ad at midnight and i'll get into what's wrong with date time in a bit so you know i haven't specified a time zone there uh but it's it's then ish uh the unix epoch is 1st of january 1970 ad um in the gregorian calendar uh at midnight and the fact that uh sorry in utc midnight utc so you may uh everyone uses that same epoch whether or not you would rep represent that epoch as midnight in 1970 or maybe if you're on if you say you're on the west coast of the us uh so you're in utc minus seven you could decide to say well the epoch is 1969 december 31st um at 20 uh sorry at, at 1700 west coast time because those represent the same instance in time if someone had clicked their fingers at the unix epoch then someone in the west coast of the us would hear it at i think 1700 so 5 pm and they could say well that's the same instant it's the epoch great and then the representation of any instant is we've agreed on which epoch to use that's sort of not part of the value it's fixed and we just say how many seconds or milliseconds or ticks or nanoseconds how much time has elapsed since that epoch okay um now already even though this is the most fundamental concept we've got the problem of what happens to leap seconds and i i would love to say I don't have time to tell you all the details of leap seconds right now. The truth is I don't know all of the details of leap seconds. They are phenomenally difficult things. I know that there are different uh, different timelines of UT0 and UT1 and UT2 and TAI and things. Um, the good news is you probably don't need to care. If you do, firstly, I'm really sorry that you need to care. Your life must be difficult when it comes to dates and times. You probably have much better sources of information than me, and that's great. Uh, so, you know, go do do your thing with leap seconds. The rest of us will just pretend that we're living in a world without leap seconds where it's obvious what it means. If I say there have been three million uh, milliseconds or whatever it is since the Unix epoch, we'll just pretend that's nice and simple. Okay, so that's instance in time. The next idea is a calendar. 
or calendar system. And a calendar system is uh, a way of breaking up the instance of time sort of in conjunction with with time zones which i'll come on to later it's all kind of nastily interrelated but it's a way of breaking up the time that you experience into days weeks months years and almost every calendar system that i'm aware of has the idea of years and the idea of months and the idea of days within a month um there's an interesting calendar system i might come on to later if we have time called the Pi calendar system uh, and there are some other interesting calendar systems uh, with eras as well so most well certainly the Gregorian calendar system has the eras of AD and BC there are other calendar systems with eras um, and the Japanese calendar system is particularly interesting because each emperor gets their own era uh, which makes things very difficult to predict you know if you don't know who the emperor is going to be in 10 years time you can't predict anything about dates and times in that calendar system so it's a way of splitting up time into days months and years so the Gregorian calendar system has 12 months, each 28 to 31 days long, with rules that most of us are probably familiar with, and that's nice and simple, but don't assume that's the only calendar system there is. There are multiple Hebrew, uh, sorry, multiple Islamic calendar systems. There's the Hebrew calendar system with different ways of um, expressing month numbers. Uh, there's interesting quirks like should days start at midnight which we tend to assume or should they start at sunset as the sort of strict observational Hebrew calendar system does so this is all very I, I really want to make the point that this is a human concern that computers don't really care about calendar systems themselves they they're only useful for human interactions whereas the idea of an instant in time is sort of universal it's inherent um it makes sense for a computer to know about an instant without any reference to anything cultural uh, so humans everywhere would agree on an instant but may use different calendar systems okay the the next concept is tightly related to calendar system which is a local date and time so i said the calendar system is what breaks up time into these years months and days and a local date and time is just one of those so it, it's saying okay in the gregorian calendar system um for me personally my local so it's it's only going to be correct for me my local date and time right now is 2020 june the 15th uh 3 29 p.m with some you know whatever precision you want to add to it now for my friends in Russia watching this, um, it may be 5.29 p.m. So that's your local time zone, your local date and time rather. Um, mine happens to be 3.29 p.m. So you can express a local date and time without reference to a time zone, but at that point you don't know what instant it is. So just to go back to our example, the instant of now, corresponds to a local date and time for me of 329 and for friends in moscow or st petersburg it would be 529 for the same instant in time so if you only know the local date and time and you don't know the time zone you can't possibly know what instant in time was being represented and in some cases that's absolutely fine and you don't need to know that um and in other cases you do so the other thing to note is that a local date and time is comprised of a date and a time. Those are two separable things. I said at the start that I would go into a little bit about what I don't like about date time, by which I mean, you know, system.datetime in .NET. So if you want to represent a date in .NET, you use system.datetime. If you want to represent a date and time in .NET, you use a system.datetime. Okay, now these are two different things. You know, the idea of what time it is here now is not the same as what the date is. Um, 
So it's annoying that you only have one type to represent that. It gets worse when you think that a system dot date time can mean in your system local time zone, it can mean in some time zone, but I'm not going to tell you which, or it can mean in UTC. <laughs> and that confusion makes it really hard to work with with confidence. The trouble is it's really easy to work with and be somewhat confident that you know, it works in it works on my machine. Will it work on someone else's machine? I don't really know. Um, and this is a problem that the it's not modeled really cleanly. It's not well defined exactly what it means. Now, other people can say the same thing about no time by not taking leap seconds into account. I'm not very clearly defining what some things mean. Um, but that's a, a deliberate omission um, that doesn't affect many people, whereas not being able to represent a date or a time of day is uh, a bit annoying in .NET. Uh, .NET doesn't have anything that is really time of day. If you look at system.datetime dot time of day, that returns a time span. And you might think that's fine because that's the time the elapsed time since midnight. Well, except it might not be because if if it's 8 a.m., then maybe seven hours have elapsed since midnight, maybe eight hours have, maybe nine hours have, depending on whether your time zone went through a daylight saving time change or some other time zone transition. Um, so it's not really a, a time of day is not an amount of time elapsed um, since midnight. And that's why in Node Time we have local time, which means you know time of day, local date and local date time, which is the two of them smushed together. Um, when I model a time of day, I in Node Time, I do not model a calendar system in that but I do model it in a local date. So a local date knows what the calendar system is. So it, it doesn't just know it's this year, this month, this day. It can tell you, well, what's the day, date going to be tomorrow? And you can only do that if you know the, uh, the calendar system. As a very simple example, two very closely related calendar systems are the Julian calendar system and the Gregorian calendar system, because they only differ in which are leap years. So suppose it's um, 2100 in the Gregorian calendar system, that's not a leap year, in the Julian calendar system it is. So if I give you a date and say, it's the 28th of February uh, 2100, what's the date tomorrow? You can only tell me if you know what calendar system we're talking about. Okay. Um, Let's move on to time zones. This is everyone's favorite, favorite uh, topic. It's really the bit that most people understand is difficult. Um, and either they don't understand it's difficult and they get it wrong because they don't care, or they understand it's difficult and they think it's so difficult that it's like, oh, well, I can't possibly get it. Therefore I'll muddle through and hope. And my message to you today is you don't have to, you can, you can understand what's going on with time zones, but at the same time, I'll probably scare you a little bit more, um, in terms of how things change. So a time zone is a region of the planet where local time, as in the time on someone's wristwatch, um, is the same across that whole region. So when there are uh, time zone transitions, which isn't changing from one time zone to another, but it's changing your watch because the time zone has undergone a transition, your offset from UTC has changed, where UTC is just kind of a, a fairly arbitrary line in the sand that everyone can agree on, which means we've all got a reference point to refer to. Uh, so currently the UK is on UTC plus one, and Moscow is on UTC plus three, and I can subtract those and say, oh, that means Moscow is two hours ahead of me, you know, three minus one. Um, so that's how I know that it's 335 for me, but 535 for someone watch watching in Moscow. And the time zone that Moscow is in is not just um, everyone whose watch currently says it's 535 PM, because there might be people who are who have that on their wristwatch at the moment, 
so they can agree with someone say in moscow that that's the current time but maybe this time tomorrow they would disagree because of how time zone rules work and maybe they've gone from utc plus three to utc plus two whatever it is so the idea is a time zone is a region of earth that is always as far as we know you know into the past and into the future people's wristwatches say the same thing if they're correct now even that introduces a bit of ambiguity because i said into the future and we don't know what's going to happen in the future currently the europe london time zone does cover wales for example uh the the country to the west of england and um maybe wales will become independent in 10 years time and decide that they want to have a different time zone and maybe england is still observing daylight saving time and wales decides not to for example this is just a completely random example um so at that point the time zone in england and the time zone in wales would have to be different even though at the moment they're the same just because we can't predict the future um accurately so it's very much here is a region where we we expect we have no reason to believe that they will be different in the future and we believe they were the same in the past as well and even that in the past has the subtlety of well how far back do you want to go so if your application only deals with things you know reasonably modern events then suppose there was a time in the 1950s where england and wales um used different uh different time zone offsets um does that matter um well, if your application doesn't care about the 1960s, then no, it can still view England and Wales as one time zone. Whereas if you're trying to do um, something, a historical application for the whole of the 20th century, then you would want to represent England and Wales as different time zones in that case. Just to clarify, I don't believe that Wales was on different time in the 1960s. This is all as an example. So we've got the idea that the the time zone, the sort of domain of the time zone is the region of the world where everyone's wristwatch says the same thing for the period of history that we're interested in as far as the future that we can predict as best we can predict it. Already sounding a bit fuzzy. Um, and a time zone basically predicts at any instant in time what should someone's wristwatch say in that time zone it's as simple as that in sort of very concrete terms um if you want to put it in more abstract terms it is a function uh from instant to local date time and it's not a bijection uh if you're a mathematician because um the it doesn't go backwards and let me explain why so most time zones uh have a standard time and a daylight saving time and in the spring you spring forward by skipping an hour and in the autumn or fall you fall back by putting your watch back an hour so in the uk for example in the spring and i can never remember the dates but something like march 26th ish um at one in the morning if you're if you're watching your wristwatch um very closely it would go you know 125958 125959 2 in the morning it would skip everything everything that started with 10 something 1 you know 110 etc in the autumn i really can't remember sometime in october probably um we will fall back and we'll go uh you know 15958 15959 one o'clock and we'll have the whole of that one o'clock till two o'clock a second time so even though it's very well defined if you're trying to convert from an instant in time to a local date time that is well defined for any given time zone if you're trying to go back if you say well the user told me that they did something at 1 30 in the morning on a particular date and i know their time zone then you need to take into account three different options one is the by far the most common one which is 
well, you know the instant in time because there was only one instant that maps to 1.30 in the morning. Great, lovely. Um, I'll say that's for all but two hours of the year in most time zones, that's what you'll get. But maybe the user had to be lying or at least misunderstood, you know, incorrect for one reason or another, because 1.30 in the morning was skipped. They told us they, that they were awake at 1.30 in the morning, but we actually skipped from one o'clock till two o'clock because of the spring forward. And we don't know what time they actually meant. Um, option. Then there's the ambiguous option where they tell us, you know, at 1.30 in the morning, I looked at my clock and we can say, okay, yes, I can see you might've done that. Did you do it the first time it was 1.30 or the second time it was 1.30? Because those two both happened with an hour between them. They could have looked at their clock and seen it was 1.30 and then 40 minutes later, seen that it was 1.10, which sounds completely bizarre until you think, oh, but it was going back in the time zone. Yeah, I see. To clarify, that's still, you're still in one time zone. Your UTC offset changes, your time zone does not. So that's roughly what a time zone is, but I want to take you into the process of time zones, how they're defined. So there are two main sources of information for time zones. Um, one is the Windows time zone database. Um, and one is what, which is used by Windows, and one is the Olsen or TZ or TZDB or IANA, or probably some other names by now, time zone, which is what everything else uses. Um, and an IANA time zone idea is something like Europe slash Paris or Europe slash London, etc. And this is maintained, the time zone database for every time zone it might say, um, oh, Europe Guernsey, that's just a link to Europe London. So there's the idea of aliases, but there's also for each zone, there's some rules and those rules can be shared in the, the, the complexities you don't need to know about, but there are rules basically saying, oh, well, this happened in 1935 and we had something, you know, the UK did weird things between 1968 and 1961. Okay, fine. And now we're onto this pattern. Um, and that, that set of rules can tell you for any instant in time, as best that database knows, what were people's wristwatches saying? But things change. And again, this isn't changing from one time zone to a different time zone, but the rules themselves can change. It's also not changing. This is not the kind of change that is, I'm moving my watch an hour forward. It's, I'm going to change what the, uh, what the prediction is for what your wristwatch should say at a particular instant. And this is because laws change. So this is actually happening at the moment um, in the European Union. And then there's, you know, because of Brexit, we don't know exactly what will happen in the UK, whether we'll follow the European Union or not. But it's likely that in the next few years, the European Union will stop observing daylight saving time. They'll stop the whole spring forward, fall back thing. And each, each of the time zones in Europe will just have, well, this is our UTC offset from here onwards until in a hundred years time, we decide to go back to doing daylight saving time because we don't like ourselves or whatever. Um, so in order for that to happen, there has to be a law passed. And that law is what changes the content of the time zone. It changes the rules of the time zone. You're not in a different time zone. You can think of it as you're in a different version of a time zone. And in fact, that's exactly what uh, we provide in, in Noda time. We say, well, here's version 2020A of the time zone database. And you can load that in one thing and load, load 2020B and say, well, I've got one instant in time. What does each of those versions of time zone rules predict people will have on their wristwatch at given instance in time? I'll come back to those rules later on, but I did want to really clarify that a time zone 
the predictions made by a time zone can change without someone changing their time zone. <coughs> and likewise, your UTC offset can change without you changing your time zone. And that the latter is just normal and happens a couple of times a year for most time zones. Okay, that's by far the most complex topic. So if you've been a bit sort of, whoa, oh, I don't know what's going on anymore, please relax a bit. Um, the rest is mostly simpler. Okay, um, let's talk durations and periods. So these are two very related concepts. And I sort of, I've cheated a bit because I kind of talked about durations before. When I mentioned that the, in, that the representation of an instant is typically some fixed epoch that everyone agrees on, and then it's the number of seconds or milliseconds or whatever from that instant in time to whatever instant you're trying to describe, that difference, whether it's the number of seconds, number of milliseconds, number of seconds, that is a duration. And it's the same duration whenever it's applied. So um you know the difference between um 235 utc today and 240 that duration is the same as between 250 and 255 you know, they're both five minutes long and it's well defined periods so that that doesn't durations have nothing to do with calendar systems periods absolutely do have to do with calendar systems they are things like a year or a month or maybe five seconds that's still a period it's also a duration um because it's nice and fixed there's nothing that varies in length of time in five seconds whereas if i say i will meet you two months from today how long is two months well it might be 61 days it might be 58 days it depends on what calendar system we're using and also what the current date is so those are two important types to to distinguish <clears throat> the time span struct in .NET is absolutely equivalent to duration but there's nothing equivalent to a period in .NET you can say you can use date time dot add months but you can't say well here is a period that I will pass around, which is one month and three days. Okay, those are the concepts that I'm going into today. <clears throat> As you can hear, my voice is starting to go already. Um, so that's a great time to uh, take a little break and have a bit of a discussion and Max can um, feed me any questions that we've had so far on the chat. So um, <clears throat> typically uh, people are shy for some reason during online conferences, <laughs> maybe they're waiting for a Zoom uh, meeting. So, but I have one question uh, mm -hmm. uh, regarding the the talk. So, what would uh, what would you do if you had a chance to um, to rework date time uh, from the from huh. from scratch? So, um, I would pretty much make it look like Noda time, ideally. And yeah, if anyone from Microsoft is listening, if they would like to take um, Noda time, take it off my hands. You're, you're very welcome to it. I I have no problem shutting down the Noda time project because it becomes part of .NET five. Um, that would be great. Yeah, you know, it's I, I wrote it because I felt that it's addressed a need, not because I felt I wanted to show off with dates and times or anything. <coughs> um. So yeah, I think for the most part, I would design it like Node of Time. There are a few little bits of Node of Time that either I've had to design in order to fit in with date time. As an example, when you call um, date time to string, it uses your current culture, which I really don't like. Um, but we do the same thing in Node of Time by default. Uh, we do provide nicer ways of manipulating text with dates and times um but we have to sort of swallow and, and use the current culture um by default for uh for the string but yes for the most part i would do it pretty much as no time 
Oh, okay, so that's a uh, that's a good point that uh, some of uh, of uh, the audience who are interested in designing some uh, better implementation for for day uh, for date times, uh, so they can just examine the another implementation which is already uh, have been uh, designed. Oh yeah, and we have one more question. So does not uh -huh. time has its own data types, and how are they mapped to database ones? That's a question from Alex. Uh, from right, so so Noda time has lots of types. So when I've talked about local date, local time, local date time, um, I didn't mention zone date time, but Noda time has lots of types. Uh, if if people are <clears throat> interested in API design, then it's worth considering whether you agree with my design for Noda time or not. I'm not saying it's right, but something to think about is in no time we deliberately force you to make choices that you don't need to make when you're using date time or date time offset and time zone info so for example i can from uh, local time back to instant if you use time zone info um, and you try to do that you'll just get an exception if things go wrong you can't say well I want to, you can ask whether it will happen or not, and then say, okay, I want to, I want to do this. Um, but it's <clears throat> in no time you say, well, I want to perform this dangerous mapping and here's what I want you to do if it's an ambiguous time or if it's skipped. So the idea is we, as the authors of no time, we're asking, we're encouraging developers to really think, well, what? what data type do you really want to use instant or zone date time or local date time you need to work out what data you're trying to represent and when you've made those decisions which we can't make for you we try to then make it as easy as possible for you to express your decisions in code <coughs> excuse me um so yes lots of different ty data types in terms of database representations, um, that gets really tricky. I don't actually have very much experience of working with databases and date time code. Um, my, my limited experience is that databases are really confusing because they're not very well documented in terms of um, what they mean. You know, what is the date time in SQL? Is it a local one? Is it unspecified time zone? Is it UTC? Can I specify the time zone? In Postgres, there's a, a delightful sounding type of timestamp with time zone. And you might think that that would consist of a timestamp and a time zone, because it says it's a timestamp with time zone. No, it, it's actually just a timestamp. It represents an instant in time, has no idea what time zone it is. All that type means is when you originally do a conversion uh if you specify a particular timestamp it will treat it as if it's in one time zone and move it to utc and i think it, it always represents utc so it very much depends on your time zone uh, sorry on your database um i would generally recommend um firstly seeing if someone else has already come up with if you're using node time see whether someone else has already come up with a mapping that handles your database and <clears throat> the whatever um, ORM you're using. So you know, people have written uh, NuGet packages to work with uh, Noda time and Entity Framework Core and Postgres, and you know, lots of people have put in work to try to get it right. Um, I can't really say much about it i'm not an expert in that domain if you can't find a database integration thing <clears throat> which just fits with node time then uh, we do provide a load of conversions between node time types and the system date time and date time offset and time zone info types excuse me <coughs> oh you would think with the amount of speaking i would i do i'd be better than this um and there's something about working, doing the th things remotely just makes my voice go quickly. Um, but yes, we, we allow good conversions f f to um, date time, 
types, you will typically lose a bit of precision there because as of No Design 2, which was released a few years ago, uh, we have a precision of nano times, sorry, nanoseconds, because that's where I felt the industry was going. Um, whereas it's just ticks, which is 100 nanoseconds or 10 nanoseconds, I can never remember. I think it's 100 um, in .NET. So if you're happy to lose that bit of precision <clears throat> and you're confident in the integration between the .NET types and your database, so ideally you want to understand your node time type, understand the date time type that you're using and say, okay, I'm going to just briefly use this, temporarily use this, and I know that it will do the right thing at the database and I know exactly what that means. Um, then go ahead and do that. If you do that, I, obviously I'm going to say that you should use node time as much as possible because I'm the author, I'm very biased, um, but I would say you get the most benefit out of node time if you can use it for as much of your code as possible. And if you need to uh, have a different representation just when you're saving the to the database or loading from the database, then just minimize how long that is. Make it just for that purpose. And so you have some code that every time you want to save one of your normal domain objects that's ex expressed in node time, it goes through this database related object, saves it to the database and then loading, load it back to the database type um, or database oriented type, then load it into your domain object doing the node time conversions on the way. <clears throat> While that sounds a lot of a, a, a lot of hassle, I typically find that having a distinction between this is the representation I want to use for most of my code and this is the representation that makes it easy to store and that's not just for the database that's for JSON and all kinds of things I find that a really useful thing to do it does mean you write a lot of boring code that just copies properties for the most part and then there's one property that you have to do something different with converting a type or whatever it is um so it leads to some boring code but it means that each of your types is designed specifically for the context it's used in <clears throat> okay uh any more questions max or shall i keep going with the presentation we have some and i, I appreciate that once i've uh, mentioned that people are shy people start to yes, ask yes. questions <laughs> so uh, that, that's a really good thing guys and th that's a really Absolutely. weird experience not only to you but for speakers as well i participated in a couple of conferences and it's so weird that after the talk you just stay silent you hear nothing that's really strange yeah. you know <laughs> so we have some more uh nikita is asking do you know if uh, if you know any languages with good implementation of uh, daytime in the uh, standard library uh so one of the one of my guilty secrets is i don't know very many languages in any kind of depth at all i am very aware of java uh both as a language i haven't followed it closely for the last several years but um i'm aware of its uh java.time types so Please, if you're using Java, ignore Java Util Date, ignore Java Util Calendar, Java.text.simple date format. Those are terrible, terrible types. Yeah, you know, I I took a lot of the design of Node Time from the Joda Time Java library that was that came about because Java Util Calendar was so terrible. And in some ways I think Node Time suffers because the system.datetime types are pretty easy to use so long as you don't really care about being precise about what you mean so you can get a long way with them without having to think too much <clears throat> which is precisely the problem um whereas java made you think about things and then made it hard to express yourself system.datetime makes it easy to not you don't have to think and then when you express it you're not expressing anything very precisely node time makes you think but then hopefully makes it easy to express things so joda time was around for a long time became really really popular and was then basically brought into the java standard library uh, something called jsr 310 um now it, it wasn't exactly as joda time they simplified some things got rid of some design mistakes etc um introduced some new concepts but yes the java.time package um, is quite similar to node time in various ways there are definitely significant differences um, 
and you could definitely argue that they made the right call and I made the wrong call or whatever um but it's 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 good um I would be able to express myself using java.time clearly I'm sure um I've seen some python aspects that are pretty good I've seen some python bits that are not so good um javascript is interesting because <clears throat> it did have a pretty terrible api and they've recently been standardizing and i think it is now part of the ECMA standard for javascript um a much better api that is also somewhat no time like um and that's partly because uh the same you know things that are good ideas uh people will look at um, and come to similar conclusions and partly I happen to know uh, at least one possibly two of the people involved in that standardization effort and I know that we think along the same lines because we've talked about things a lot um, it's a relatively small world in the date time enthusiasts um, world um, so yeah I would say Java is good uh, JavaScript I believe is good now if you're using the most modern ones beyond that i'm less qualified to say perfect so i think that we might be running late now so we have some more questions but we still have time after the talk and in the discussion yep. zone so let's <clears throat> continue with the talk okay yes if we could switch to my presentation then please brilliant so uh the the second half of this is really um things that you shouldn't do or things that you might be doing and you could do better. Um, and I will try to go through these reasonably quickly. I, there's a lot that I can rabbit hole on here and that's probably not actually as useful as getting back to some of the questions. So um, firstly, there's uh, datetime.now. Oh, yeah, now. Um, and the, the bit in light type that if you can't see properly, it, says don't trust blow dart who is barry doran's um uh, blow dart on twitter is barry doran's a good friend of mine a fantastic chap uh who works for microsoft and uh we have a a healthily um respectful really but you know we we like to play with each other uh to to joke with each other about our code um so i took the mickey out of uh out of barry because he had datetime.now in some of his um, sample code. So datetime.now returns you, it, so firstly, it's a property. Secondly, it's static. Thirdly, it converts from the system clock, always knows about UTC. That's its sort of native representation. And it converts it to the local time zone. <clears throat> if you ever see this in server side code, just scream and fix it because uh if you are a server or other if your code running on a server you shouldn't care what time what time zone your server is in i should be able to come up with some weird time zone that is three hours and 42 minutes away from utc run my website or whatever and no one should know any different because the no one cares what time your server thinks it is what time zone your server thinks it is in they absolutely care what time your users are in and those may be multiple time zones with multiple users who have to interact with each other but your system time zone your server time zone no awful so um if you absolutely want to know okay i want to use my system local time zone which can absolutely be fine uh i'm writing a couple of client apps uh, in wpf at the moment and when i log things i want to log that in the system local time zone because that's what the users would expect you know if they see at the moment it's 404 pm if they do something and see a log entry coming up they expect it to say 404 pm if it says 304 pm then they'll go hey why are you why is your code an hour wrong so for that i actually i remember the the real instant in time so if i write the log file to disk so that someone can email it to me i will get it in utc with no problems there no possibilities of them skipping back an hour but what i put on the screen for them is their system local time zone but that should be a very deliberate choice you should be saying i want to use the system default time zone at this point and ideally, you should be able to do that in a testable way. So that comes to the second problem of datetime.now. It's static. 
if your code uses even datetime.utc now, which is much better to use than datetime.now in most cases, um, how are you going to test that your code works properly when the time zone skips forward and backward an hour, you know, when the UTC offset changes within your time zone? It's really hard to do that. Um, so something you can do, even if you're still working with system.datetime, is introduce the idea of a service that tells you what is the current instant in time. I typically call it iClock with a get current timestamp or get current instant method. Um, but it's really simple to do. So you can have that as an interface, use normal dependency injection and have one implementation, the simple implementation of system clock implements iClock, one method get current instant that returns uh, datetime.utc now. And the fact that that implementation uses a static thing is fine because all of the rest of the code around just knows about iClock. And then you can write your own implementation that's a fake clock that says, okay, uh, you want to pretend that it is this particular instant in time. That's fine. I will say that that's what the time is. And then you could maybe write something to say, advance the clock by half an hour. So each time your code asks for things, um, it sees time uh, going forward. That way, that's by far the biggest tip I have to, to make things testable via an interface that represents what is the current time. The next thing that's wrong with datetime.now is it's a property. Now properties typically, when you call the same property multiple times, it should return the same value. It would be useless if datetime.now did that forever. Um, it should be a method. And this is, I made the mistake in uh, node time one of saying, oh, I'll follow date time dot now. I called it iClock.utc now, I think, um, but I made it a property. And that was a mistake that I fixed in node time two. It was a breaking change. And I apologize to all the users for getting it wrong in V1. I don't apologize for breaking them between V1 and V2, because I think that was the right thing to do while we had relatively fewer users. Um, now, you know, more users will have a good code, a good code base that calls a method when it wants to compute something effectively. So that's all about finding the current, current days and time. Um, you might also want to inject the, the system default time zone. Um, that's uh, harder to do even with node time, but typically what you would do is maybe on system startup, you find what is the system current time zone and you know, we support multiple time zone providers and all of them have what is the current time zone in that time zone provider. So even if you're on Windows, if you're using the, I, uh, if you want to use IANA time zones uh, to be portable with other systems, um, you say, what what is the current time zone in the TZDB time zone provider, and it gives you the right thing. Uh, it maintains a mapping. Okay, my next big, uh, big message is to think. Um, that's not quite as patronizing as it sounds, but it's it really is reinforcing the main message of this talk, which is um, time date and time stuff is difficult, but it is possible. And if you take a step back and think, you will be able to be successful and uh, write code that you can be confident in. But it does take some effort. So uh, it takes effort at two times. Firstly, my hope is that when .next is over, you know, don't do this until .next is over, that you've got loads of great content to watch. Um, but after that, think, Joe, I'm going to set aside a morning or an afternoon. Why not set aside this Friday afternoon? Okay, um, it's actually my birthday on Friday, so I'm not going to be doing any work. But if you're doing some work, um, why don't you say to your boss, do you know what? I know that my my code it has problems around dates and times. Um, so Friday afternoon, I'm not going to work on fixing those problems. I'm going to work on understanding more about date and time because I've seen this one talk from John and that's just one hour and he didn't go into all the details, but I can do some research. There's lots of good information on uh, on all of this. Um, read the Node Time user guide 
at least gets you a fair fair distance have a think about it make sure you really understand what is a time zone what is a canon system which of these things does my code need to care about then start working what does that mean for my code base so that's a sort of preparatory step to prepare you as a person then there's the second thing is whenever you're doing something with date and time think well what type should i be doing here is this is a user telling me what time they want to schedule something for if so well is that a zone date time is it a local date time maybe it's just the time of day if you're doing um a mobile phone alarm you just want to say well whenever it's seven o'clock in the morning please ring the alarm that's just a local time that's not got a date attached to it it's just a time um so don't just kind of reach for system dot date time because that's the only thing in my toolbox so it's what i reach for every time and there's date time offset as well which is often the right thing so even if you're using date time um you know, using the bcl types you ought to think about that but if you put time into making the right choice to start with with your data types and writing documentation and comments um I've heard the mantra of you know, if there are comments in implementation code that shows that the code could be simplified. No, not always. There can be times where your uh, the comments can explain why you're doing something. They don't say what it's doing. That should be clear. But they say why your code is doing that. Um, because I've got this requirement that we support whatever it is. Um, just explain your thought process because then if some if the requirements change later on you can see ah i made that decision based on that choice based on that requirement the requirements change maybe my choice should change maybe it should i need to think about it again but at least i can tell why i made that choice the number of times i've seen even code i've written and gone why did i do that i i remember spending a long time writing this code but i have no idea why i wrote it like that do yourself a favor and document it. I, maybe it doesn't have to be a comment. If you prefer to write that in a design doc somewhere, then that's fine. Personally, I like having it you know, right where the code is. Um, but yeah, take some time to think. I've already talked about injecting a clock. Um, ambiguity. Hmm. Ambiguity is a pain, and I'll give two different examples of this. One is system.datetime, which I've railed against already, uh, because if I give you a date time, and it says it's 4 13 pm you don't know unless you know what question to ask whether that's utc or the system local time zone or some unspecified time zone and you can get at that information by datetime.kind but it means that you don't really if you're just writing some code that uses a date time either you need to put an assertion on that says i only accept date time values with a kind of utc i've written that assertion many many times or um you assume which is worrying um, or maybe you've got code that will work whatever it is and that's that's fine but you can't lean on the type system to help you make the right decision and that's annoying um you also can't express uh some more subtleties around forgetting the time zone i only want the date part of you know, this this method returns a uh, system dot uh date time that is always at midnight because it's just representing a date well that's fine but then the calling code needs to either you know remind the the reader of that um or uh, documented in some way maybe use the right variable names to make that clear but it gets hard so that's why i particularly like the the proliferation of types in node time mean that it's it's very clear what you mean because you choose the right type for it the other kind of amb ambiguity entirely different kind of ambiguity is around time zones um if I ask some of my American colleagues at the moment in Seattle or in Mountain View what time zone they're in, some of them um, would say, oh, I'm in PDT. And they mean Pacific Daylight Time. And if I ask them in winter, they'll say, oh, I'm in PST, by which they mean Pacific Standard Time. Those aren't time zones. 
Um, so PST and PDT are acronyms. Um, they're abbreviations for those things that aren't time zones. Uh, they're in America, Los Angeles in TZDB speak. Um, but people will use these three letter acronyms, three letter abbreviations, and even without ambiguity, they're annoying because you don't really know what they mean. You know, they don't represent a time zone. They represent a bit of a name and a current UTC offset. It doesn't really say when it will go back. Um, there can be multiple time zones that all say, I'm in Pacific Standard Time and Pacific Daylight Time, but differ in terms of when they change between the two. Um, I'm not actually sure whether that's the case for Pacific, but there are certainly some, if you're currently in Central Standard Time, you may be in a time zone that never goes into Central Daylight Time, for example. Um, so avoid those. The reason they're ambiguous as well is that sometimes the same abbreviation like CST can be used to mean central summer time or central standard time or central standard time in a different time zone. Um, so please just, just never use those. Okay, uh, next limiting scope. I've mentioned already about leap seconds. You probably don't need to care about leap seconds. Hopefully you probably don't need to care about calendar systems other than the Gregorian calendar. Um, if you're writing a calendar application, you probably do. You know, you might want to be able to support, um, you know, I have Jewish friends. They want to be able to schedule things in the Jewish, the Hebrew calendar system. So please do that. And that means you need to understand about leap years and things, um, or the leap months rather. And again, if you're using the right time, uh, the right date and time library, Noda time provides what I think is pretty good support for that. Um, if you're using system.datetime, even though you can construct a system.datetime by specifying year, month, day, and calendar, it just says, okay, I'll convert that to Gregorian, and I've lost the information about what calendar you were originally specified. So I, the point of this bullet, this, this slide, is um, limiting your scope. So really, if you don't need to know about different calendar systems, then don't. If you don't need support, leap seconds, don't. If you don't need to support time zones, maybe you know one of the one of the things I'm working on at the moment. Um, I only really care about the local time for the user who is using it. I I could just use datetime.now everywhere, not care about UTC, not care about time zones at all. This is what it comes back to thinking. I can't give you the answers for your application because every application is different. I've mentioned avoiding time zone abbreviations and this is my final, I've got two slides on, on this one topic, but it's it's the last topic. Um, a lot of people will say, oh, time zones are easy. You just convert from what the user said to UTC, store that, and you never need to have any problems with time zones again. And sometimes that is true. And in particular, if, uh, if your source of time information is a system clock because you're you're not predicting things in the future you're just recording timestamps when something happens you're logging or something like that or it's a database timestamp then storing utc is great yes absolutely that's fine but suppose you are writing something and a user can schedule something in the future oh this becomes a problem let me show you why so um, now this, this slide I have had for a long time, as you can see, um, I, I do have a copy that's been updated, but I, I would have to keep on updating it because the rules haven't changed yet. But if a user sometime, well, maybe, maybe today they say, I want to book a meeting for nine o'clock in the morning on December the 1st. And instead of saying 2019, we'll say 2022. So, you know, two and a half years from now, the system if it's going with the whole store UTC, because everything will be fine, would say, oh, right, okay, what's uh, what's the instant in time that will be nine o'clock in the morning in 2022 on December the 1st? Oh, right, you're at Paris will be UTC plus one. I will store eight o'clock in the morning UTC. Then what I expect to happen in the next couple of years is 
the French government with the rest of the EU will say, oh no, we're abandoning daylight saving time. We're going to be on permanent summer time. And now the rules have changed for that same time zone. And if you did the same computation today of saying, well, what instant in time represents nine o'clock in the morning on December the 1st, 2022, you would say, oh, that's 8 a.m. UTC. So it doesn't make much sense to me that your system, if the user does the same thing today or in a year's time, they say, I want you to book a meeting for nine o'clock in the morning. You would expect that to store the same thing in both cases. But if you're just storing UTC, you would store different things because your context has changed. Then it, you, know, you don't know that anything bad has happened until the user says, oh, what, what meetings have I got today? And the system says, I will convert the 8 a.m. UTC that I stored to Paris time. Oh, that's 10 o'clock in the morning. And you show up at 10 o'clock just as your uh, investor or you know, really important business colleague uh, leaves and says, well, you were meant to be here an hour ago. What are you doing? You've lost information by by losing what time zone people were in. Um, I've got a whole blog post on this because uh, this this slide blows most people's minds. Um, so if you search for uh, storing UTC is not a silver bullet, you'll find a whole blog post about it. Um, hopefully we can link to it from the .next website as well. Um, and it goes into a lot more detail and tells you what you can do to um, to fix this. So. In summary, I've said all of this before, you don't need to read it, I'll say it again. Um, be aware that you can get this right, you can be confident if you take some time to think about it. Um, and then when you have thought about it, make sure that whoever's reading your code doesn't need to think about it very much because they can see exactly what your thought process was. And you know, maybe they do need to think about it because things have changed, but they can still tell what you were thinking and say, ah, this bit has changed. Therefore, that's where I need to start thinking about differences. Um, inject a, a clock. I don't care whether you call it iClock. You can make up your own one. Uh, you could publish a NuGet package that just has iClock in if you want. Uh, obviously, no time has it to start with. So, um, you know, just don't use datetime.now or datetime.utc now. Um, think about your specific context. What does your application need to do? And try to get rid of anything that you don't need to care about. Uh, doing just what your application needs is hard enough. Don't make it any harder for yourself than you need to be. Get rid of any mention. It's okay to format things and tell people because humans know about CST and CDT. They don't know that they're not time zones, but they will know what you mean. So if you're displaying something to someone, then sure, that's fine. But um, it's it's a strictly display only concept is these three letter abbreviations. And finally, as I was just saying, normaling, normalizing to UTC is not a silver bullet. <laughs> I said I would leave you in the same way I started, so please be kind with people who disagree with you. Um, if you disagree with me about something, that doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't make me a bad person either. We can still be uh, considerate human beings to each other. Um, and if you take nothing else from the, uh, from the talk, then let's be kinder to each other, then that's fine by me. And that's me done. Thank you very much. Max, do we have any more questions? John, it was interesting to know once again. And anytime, literally anytime when I have uh, date times involved in my project, I have issues with that. So maybe next time, the next time, uh, I need to consider using no the time instead of system. Please do and give uh, me feedback time. as to how well it works. <laughs> yeah, because I kind of I kind of given up on system dot date time. Anytime it have some weird caveats that I don't know how to address. Oh, at least, no, I know how to address them. I just don't want to actually. <laughs> right. So anyway, yeah. um, uh, Rion is asking uh, a specific question about no time implementation. So why minus or plus operations with two local date time instances return period type, not duration type? Uh, so because you don't necessarily know the duration. So if someone says, what is the, uh, what is the difference in time, um, between say the 15th of May, 2020 at 4.25 PM and the 15th of June, 2020 at 4.25 PM, 
I can tell you that as a period, that's one month, or you can say, give it to me in days or whatever. I cannot tell you how much time has elapsed because I only have it as local date times. And if those occur in a time zone where uh, there's an hour skipped or, or done twice, then the duration would be wrong. Um, if you want to get the, the duration ignoring that factor, then just convert it to a zone date time using TUTC. Um, and then you could basically what you want to do is find the two instants in time represented by those local date times in UTC and then subtract those. Um, it's, I hope it's what people want to use when they understand what a duration is. So adding a duration to a local date time doesn't make much sense because you know, I don't know, uh, without knowing the time zone that you're in, I can't tell what the time is going to be one minute from now. Okay, makes sense. Uh, so we have another question from Vyacheslav. Mm -hmm. And Vyacheslav, I'll, I'll rephrase it slightly, uh, if you don't mind. So uh, what, would you, uh, what would you suggest uh, to do to uh, receive dates from the client side of the application with time zone, with uh, time zone or without? Uh, it really depends on the context in you know, what you're wanting to get from them. Um, if the time zone matters for the concept that you're trying to represent, then ideally have the time zone. Um, now, detecting the time zone in JavaScript is feasible these days, I believe. Um, whether the, the tricky bit comes, maybe the system that the, the user system has a different version of the time zone rules than your system does. Uh, so time zone rules can change um, very rapidly. And sometimes we don't get a lot of warning. And then even when we have a new version of the time zone database, you've got to roll that out. Um, for no time, we roll that out pretty quickly, but to get to users things, it can take a long time. Now, sensible governments will, excuse me, will give plenty of warning about that. So it shouldn't be a problem. Um, but just be aware that uh, your user's idea of the Europe London time zone may not be the same as your server's idea of the Europe London time zone because they could be using different versions. But if it if it represents something that is naturally time zone important, then yeah, go go with uh, storing the time zone. Um, unless they're if they are representing timestamps of when something happened and actually you no longer care about the time zone. Um, afterwards then maybe represent them just as instance in time that probably in a database would be in utc effectively that's how it instance are usually represented like that but think about what is important think about if the time zone rules change in the future do i want to be able to get back to the original information one golden rule is if you collect all the possible information that could be relevant from the user and i'm not saying anything privacy invasive uh, but if you store what the user told you, so going back to my scheduling example, if the user said 9 a.m. on this date in Paris, if you store all of that, then if everything else changes, you can still get the right answer. Um, even, you know, it, it gets quite subtle. Maybe they don't say in Paris, maybe they say in um, Lyon, which sorry, may John, be in the sorry, same time zone as Paris. Uh, sorry, guys, but we have um, some time limits. Yep, we're out of time. <laughs> okay, but we still have time in uh, Q and Day se uh, session zone, I believe. So, and I have some questions on uh, Telegram. So, why wouldn't we uh, switch to Zoom to finish the Q and Day session uh, session part? Excellent. Yep. See you there. Yeah.